Hello everyone and welcome to CodeCast by STL Tech Talk where we'll be giving you instructional, informative, unique, and insightful commentary on programming code. From robots to roadhouses, we will be bringing you the content you want and need. My name is JJ Hammond and I'm joined tonight by two coding experts. Up first, our guest is an ASP.NET insider, a Windows Azure insider, and an ASP.NET MVP. His specializations are in ASP.NET, Windows Azure, system design, and developer mentoring. He has helped co-found the Iowa.NET user group, Iowa Code Camp, .NET conference, and ASP conference virtual conferences. He's an avid support of the community and likes to give back by speaking at user groups, local, regional, national, and .NET user events. In his spare time, he loves spending time with his family and enjoys writing about himself in the third person. Somebody I really like to know, say hello, Javier Lozano. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, hey, it's our guest. Thank you so <laughs> much for being You know, it's, it's, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for being on sure. the show. Um, however, this show would not be possible without the king of the hill in Minnesota striving to distribute uh, development knowledge to the masses and has spent the last 20 years architecting and implementing highly scalable ASP.NET applications throughout the Twin Cities. Give it up for Gus Emery. Say hello, Gus. Hello, everyone. How's everyone going? Javier, you know, thanks so much for doing this. We Absolutely. really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Anytime, guys. I'm, I'm really excited to do this. So. Absolutely. And you can be trending on Twitter with us at uh, hashtag CodeCast. That's right. We have the hashtag CodeCast. Um, on Facebook, forward slash uh, STL Tech Talk. Find us on Google+, Plus, kind of a barren wasteland, but some techies are in there. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our iTunes, Stitcher, Windows Phone, TuneIn Radio, or the I RSS feed directly from our website so you can listen to this thing. It's best to be watched on uh, YouTube so you can really get that uh, user experience. STL Tech Talk is an experience. Visit stltechtalk.com to keep up with our tech news, podcasts, codecasts, forums, and coming soon, our how-to tutorials on gadgets and software applications. Also, we're going to be uh, uh, launching our sister site, STL Tech Chic, and uh, with Aubrey Bates. She's a wonderful writer, and I'm so looking forward to uh, having her content and uh, bringing uh, you know, the women of tech into uh, the limelight so that we can uh, help cover that for the future. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get the show kicked off. So if you're watching us live, you can ask us questions via the chat room, and we'll do our best to answer those questions in a timely manner. Um, so first of all, Javier, how's it going? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, that's um, it's going pretty good. Uh, my, like I said, my name is Javier Lozano. I actually am in Des Moines, Iowa. That's what I was keep pointing that way when we're talking about Gus. So I'm uh -huh, literally right. three miles south, not three miles, three hours south of Gus. <laughs> so yeah, um, like I said, I am involved here in the community in, um, in Iowa. We uh, we co helped co started that in a user group. We're about ten years into it, so that's been a lot of a fun ride when we started this in two thousand and four. Um, Iowa Code Camp. I've speaking a lot of regional conferences, but we you know before I was preparing for the um, for the cast. We're going through, you know, hey, are you going to be at KCDC? Are you going to be? I know you, you were at Nebraska Code Camp. So myself and Gus, I were, you know, we're huge promoters of what what's going on here in the developer community. And the more, you know, the more we do, the more addicting it becomes. So it's yeah, it's been it's been a great fun time. Yeah, surround yourself with those awesome people, and, and you definitely seem like somebody who likes giving back to the community, and there's nothing that I love more than that. So uh, from the community, thank you so much. Uh, tell us a little bit about what got you into technology, kind of what's what's the history there? What what gives you passion and drive to uh, bring you to where you are today? So that's a great question. So the thing I like about um, that got me into, into technology was that I like solving problems, right? And it wasn't until I was in fifth grade uh, where I actually got to play with a computer where... Um, I was just enthralled by it. Like this thing that you can give it commands to, and it will do what you tell it to. It was, it was. I was amazed of you know what can what things can I build with it. Yeah. And uh, and the reason why you know, and it wasn't until fifth grade I touch a uh, touch a computer because I actually I grew up in Mexico, so I was ten years old when uh, I came to United States. So I literally finished fourth grade in, in Mexico, and, and and then the fall I started fifth grade. So I had to I had to learn English I had to learn brand everything about you know everything new country and the computer was sort of my outlet right because it was like hey I can now it under it, it does what it tells it to and, and I'm learning English as I go through this so that really got me hooked into it 
Uh, and then I, I wrote a bunch of, you know, small applications in Windows 3, you know, 3.0, um, 3.1. I did some VB1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So I, that's how I cut my, my, my teeth with it. I'm not proud of it, but, but it, was, it was fun. Um, and then um, I started getting into more, you know, more advanced things like HTML back in the, you know, back in the, uh, in the middle 90s, JavaScript. And then at that point, I realized that I was pretty much done with um, doing some desktop work. And I needed to focus on the web because, you know, back then we had the marquee, you know, HTML tags and everything else. So, hey, imagine what awesome things that we can have with multiple marquee tags on a page, right? So, so that's really what got me excited about more possibilities that are out there and started dabbling with other stuff as, as I went through high school and in college. I went to college, you know, uh, I have the logo right here, Iowa State University. Uh, graduated. Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? <laughs> I, exactly. I mean, I mean, it's literally 30 miles that way. Um, but anyway, um, went computer science, loved it, um, learned a lot about um, the theory of computing and the science of computing. Oh sure, uh, and then take all that knowledge and really apply it to more of a, pack, a practical sense. So it's, it's been a fun you journey. Had learn, you had to learn how to code with the punch cards. Is that no? I'm just messing with you. <laughs> actually, it's funny you said that. I didn't, but I worked with guys at an insurance company in town that actually did learn how to punch with <laughs> code with punch cards. That's <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a trip. I mean, it's really neat to see how like the the history of it because I'm kind of a history buff a little bit. So I like that sort of thing. Um, so that, well, that's. Actually, uh, if you want a bit of history on this, and I always tell this to to the kids, right, uh, about this is that you know if you go to if you look at the old terminals, like uh, remember War Games, who, who doesn't? Yeah. And you know, you know why everybody typed an up, why you typed an uppercase? Sure. Every command is an uppercase, is because it takes less memory to store uppercase characters than it does lowercase characters. And That's when awesome. you tell and when you tell people that, it's like, really? And it's like, yeah, just look at the ASCII characters. Right. And, and the moment you showed them the table, it's like, well, this number is this, and that number is that. And it's like, it takes less memory for this. And then it just you see them just light up and go, oh, my gosh, I didn't even think about that. So We're talking about characters? <laughs> <laughs> Console <laughs> emulators, X-terminals, awesome. See, Javier, that's where my mom started on the IBM punch card systems. Back oh, in, yeah. So, like, way, way, way long time ago. So, so that's kind of a close place to my heart, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Javier, um, how do yeah. you learn about new things? How to learn about things? Uh, that's a great question. Literally, what I do is uh, I try to find a practical solution to the technology or the problem that, that I'm trying to solve, right? And I try to go as deep on it as possible. And the reason why that is is because I found out that that's typically the only way I've, I've learned, right? I have to take it completely apart and put it back together to be able to understand it. And now if I have a couple of screws left over because <laughs> because I'm taking that apart, that's fine. I but always at least, do. I period. I mean who does it? metaphorically or not, I yeah. always have some left. Hey, well, see, it, it, oh, go ahead, go ahead now, guys. Oh I was gonna say I just took the intake manifold off my truck and put it back together. Um, or the <laughs> truck and <laughs> didn't have a leftover screw. So there. That's good. That that is like screw you do not want to <laughs> miss First <time>. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 no. In all seriousness, you know, all this it's great because that way you you really get to understand what is how things work behind the covers. Yeah. And 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 it's not because you want to become this all knowing thing, right? It's because of now you understand the realm and and the approach you're going to take. What makes it? What breaks it? And the best part about it is someone says, "Well, I know you've been dabbling in X Y Z. You you help them understand it. That makes you understand it even better." Right to to me to help take your knowledge and help to teach it. That's by far the, the thing that actually forces me to learn more. Because yeah. it, it's not that because I don't want to sound like an idiot. I mean, I sound like an idiot regardless. Yeah. Right. But it's, but it's it's more one of those that I want to make sure that I'm paying it forward and I'm not wasting your time when when you're trying to address these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and and being a, a, a computer science major myself, and uh, at the University of Missouri St. Louis, I mean, understanding the understanding how the the functionalities on that back end. I mean, if you glaze over that, you cannot. You just cannot do that. There's no way to survive. Yep. Um, and uh, it's really neat that we have the opportunity to talk about some of those nuts and bolts because it, they're really interesting and kind of the things you can do with them and, and with the code and stuff is really awesome. 
Definitely, definitely. So, Javier, do you have any advice to new and upcoming developers? Yeah, that's that's it's interesting because I I actually uh, I volunteer at the uh, the high school here in town, part of this program called Hyperstream, and it's more of a STEM program where you know you get to partner with. Uh, you know, business people with high school students because I literally I wish I would have had that. You know, growing in a small town here in Iowa, I had none of that. So if again, if I can pay it forward, the, the better. And the one thing I, I tell the kids all the time is just do what you want, do your passion. If you if you wanna if you're into phones and you wanna learn how to write all the apps, then learn as much as you can about that. But please know that that thing is gonna end, right? End not that it's gonna go away. But you're going to hit that point where it's going to propel you to something else. Right. Don't view it as a challenge. View it as a, oh my gosh, I'm just growing in my knowledge. And so if you're in, if you're into phones, web, you know, whatever, you know, small Raspberry Pis, whatever those things that take the time to learn and and, uh, and also turn learn to how to figure out how that that thing can expand upon other things. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, something I was I was gonna uh, talk about was the um, the the found the foundation, right? And yeah. uh, how do you, how do you how how do you how do you approach that? Um, how do you teach people how to teach themselves, right? Because like some things are inherent, right? Like if you tell somebody, yep. you know, a quadratic equation, whatever the case may be, is done. But some some things that take just a minute, you. You don't want to discourage them, but at the same time, you want them to kind of sit and and you know twist their heads around to try to figure out how this thing works. You know, and it's got to yeah. be organic. You know, and, and and once they develop that organic you know response to you know wanting to learn new languages and um, like you said when you were a kid, you know when you came to America, I mean, so uh, computer uh, computer programming was is a language, you know, so you had to learn that as a new language. So it's it's learning to be able to speak to what you want to do, right, and to do those commands. So um, that's 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 huge. And under an understanding that I'm glad that uh, you're doing what you're doing in schools because. Lord knows that we need that in the United yeah. States for sure. Well, the one thing about it too that, that has been, I would say, the most rewarding part of all of it is seeing the kids reach their aha moment. Yeah. And everybody yeah. has it at a totally different, different, different span. Sure. And and it's it's funny because it feels like you're doing different tricks, <laughs> right, to right. teach the same thing. But there are like five, six kids in there that you're gonna have to you have to get through in a different way. Right, because everybody's different, and everybody learns. Exactly. Different. Everybody's different, right? So, so that's the fun part about it, and and it's not really that. Well, here's how you do it. You know, you should follow this, this, and this. It's more like, hey guys, let's look at Facebook, or let's look at something you guys really into it. You know how this works? No, let's dismantle it. Let's you know, let's you know, let's bring it all together. And it's like, oh wow, I didn't know I did that. It's like exactly, and yeah. and it's and it's something that the way we're talking about it now is one way. However, by the time you get to be my age, again, the old guy, um, <laughs> you, you'll realize that things have changed. But sure. understanding the foundation now, kind of how things are, and understanding how the evolution of things goes, you're going to be better prepared for whatever problem comes at next. Yeah, we had a guy on that was talking about application lifecycle management. And, you know, understanding kind of that circle, right, the circle of life a little bit. Um, really just helps you expand your horizon and understand like how you would fit in that world or what application you're working on fits either in a business or a consumer level and then how you can program to that. That's very hot stuff for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm glad you brought up STEM, Javier, because STEM is one of the things that I, you know, kind of gets me going too. Because awesome. my, my son did a lot of robotics in high school, and, and in Minnesota they made robotics actually a letterable sport or activity. So it's you can sweet. actually letter in robotics. Isn't that cool? That is pretty so, sweet. Yeah, so um, uh, actually we're having a STEM show in June, uh, June 18th with Scott Hanselman, believe it or not. Oh, um, awesome. So, to our listeners and whoever happens to watch this, you may want to tune into that one because we're going to talk, you know, uh, multiple different ways on how we can get kids interested in, in science and engineering and math and actually, uh, and for that matter, women too, because you know the the women in our in our field are are growing and growing. But as JJ mentioned earlier, it's always nice to have more women in the field. I've I've actually had quite a few women that are great programmers because they're very detail oriented people. By by nature, so it's actually really good to have them around. 
See, and it's funny you say that because you know, as of recent, you know, there have been Twitter storms left and right. It seems oh, like yeah. there's one. There's one happening right now. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, so, but the one thing that's most interesting about it is that you know this whole um, gender. You know, right? We need more women and 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 technology and so forth. I agree. You know. We, I think we don't need more women in technology. I think we need more people who want to be in technology to be yeah. in technology. Yeah, good point. And, and the reason why I said it is, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a minority, right? I came in from, United, from Mexico to the United States, and I never viewed myself as like, wait a minute, I can't do this because I'm Mexican or Hispanic or whatever label that people want to give me. Yeah. I'm doing this because I want to do it. Right. And I'm going to do the best that I can to go do it. Now, granted, I... I know that other, other people may run into different roadblocks than they are, but those are challenges that, to me, fueled me, right? And, right. To, and to make, and to be in better and doing other things. So I think the conversation needs to shift for, you know, this group and this group. It's like, no, 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 no. Anybody who wants to be doing this should be empowered to do that. And, and like you said, guess that that's really what makes all this interesting and, and should keep uh, people going. And by and now one way of start that is by going through the STEM programs and getting to school and get you know hook them while, you're, oh, while they're young, get kind of perspective, and then bring it from then on. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. And you know, it's it's not necessarily just the women, as you said. It's everybody that's passionate about the te about yeah. technology, and it doesn't matter which form of technology. It could be development, it could be IT, it could be DevOps, it could be you know um, uh, uh, mechanical or electrical engineering, you, you know aerospace science. It doesn't matter just so that we have people to actually branch out and make a cool world in 20 30 years right correct yep, yep. and and show people that it's that it's that it's pass you know that it's something you can be passionate about right like you're not going to have a secretary come into your high school and be like okay who's ready to file paperwork or or who's ready to you know uh, get their notary so that they can sign off and stamp off on something right so um, you know seeing guys like you seeing guys um, like me, seeing guys like Gus or whatever the case may be is, or or women for that matter, whoever going, hey, this is fun, this is pad, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to this. I think is is another step because it's an unfortunate side effect of of, of our uh, connection with um, you know our pop culture and things of that nature yeah. that our attention spans drop off really fast. So if you can show people that it's exciting, and, and then that helps them get in the door too. Um, even people, <clears throat> excuse me, who are uh, uh, unfortunately the cause of uh, you know of, of the you know technological revolution, yeah. people getting into it who are middle aged, you know, and saying, hey, here's where you can start, here's where you can hop in, and then them showing their kids or whatever the case may be, is it's a cascading effect to show that this is a place where. Um, it can be fun and exciting. It doesn't have to be all doom and gloom and stuff like that all the time. So um, shining the light is, is is really is really awesome. Um, I would I, I would love to continue talking about this type of stuff, but I want to see more yeah. about your uh, presentation and what you're going to be uh, showing us here tonight. Why don't uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what we're going to be doing, what what you're going to be previewing for us tonight, and what's going what's uh, going to be shown. That's great. So, um, the, the, one of the things I wanted to do here, and it's 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 difficult, you know, to do a demo or a presentation, specifically in this conversation piece. So, one of the things that I've been talking for the past year or so is, um, ace, obviously, I always talk about a speed on that. You know, that's kind of my niche. You know, it's it's my baby, uh, just because I've I've seen it growing up since it was this little into what it's grown up to be now. Um, but anyway, the the most important thing is uh, that, that I wanted to kind of talk here is that you know. As Microsoft is pushing all these new things out from the stack, um, from ASP.NET, you know, WPF, whatever, you know, then there's, they have this other thing called Azure. It's like, how can I take my skill sets, right, that I have as an ASP.NET developer and leverage something like Azure and the cloud? So kind of what the focus of this, and I have several presentations on this, I'm doing something similar at, um, at KCDC where I'll be talking about how to scale your application on the cloud. This is more focused around, hey, I'm an ASP.NET and a developer, and what does Azure mean to me? Gotcha. I kind of want to talk about a little bit, just because, uh, th again, that's my niche. I, I can, like I told Gus, I could talk to this for days, just because there's something new, diff uh, there's something new and different for every problem that you're trying to tackle. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's just a great conversation for people back and forth. And actually, I have a pretty cool demo that I think people would like of kind of how, of what, well, some of the stuff that, that I've built. So. 
Fantastic. Cool. So we want to let people know what it's going to be running on. Gus, why don't you let us know what we're going to be running this evening? Sure. So he, uh, um, I'm guessing, Javier, you're running Visual Studio probably tw uh, 2013, um, running the Azure stack, um, which, uh, by the way, for anybody that has MSDN benefits and hasn't done it yet, you can turn on your Azure benefits, which give you 50 100 or $150 a month of credit. Um, the ultimate is 150 I know that. Looks like you're going to be using some web matrix and maybe Notepad a little bit. Does that sound about yeah. right, Javier? Yeah, that's about right. We're going to be using a little bit of everything, and uh, I'll see if I can get to Notepad in a bit. Uh, but <laughs> at this point, <laughs> well, I had to throw that in there. Product. You know, and the, and the reason why I said Notepad is because that is the easiest thing to do. I mean, from like the beginning, right? It's just it's just it's a text editor. There's yep. really not, nothing behind it. So as we're as you were saying that I was actually starting up the VM because um, I'm actually doing all this on a Mac. So I'm on my Mac running Chrome, which is sinful because we're talking about Microsoft technologies, but this is the new Microsoft, so we're going to go with it. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm running a virtual machine where I just spun up Windows 8 and, and Visual Studio 2013 and all that jazz. But I'm actually not going to start there. You know, people usually begin from the, well, here's the code. Let's talk about the code, blah, blah, blah. Like, let's not, let's not worry about that. Let's actually start with something a little more exciting. Um, so what I'm going to do here, if I don't mind, fellas, I'll, I'll switch to screen share, and and I can select here what uh, I'm going to be showing. So one of the things that I've um, everything good? You guys see my screen? Okay, sweet. So one of the things I have here, I actually have a demo account where, um, um, as part of a, being an Azure Insider, they say, hey, you know, here's some free Azure credit. So you can use for demos, you can use for testing, and typically that's what I use it for. I use it for kind of having cool applications in there to try out. Uh, so in here, all the talks that I do around Azure, I keep in here. And there's different there's different ones, uh, um, different applications that I have. Now, if I'm an ASP.NET developer, one of the first things my eyes typically go to if I go to as I venture into the world of Azure is this thing called websites because. I build websites. You know, that's that's my that's my platform. But there's a bunch of other stuff out here that I can leverage as well. I won't, I won't be talking about some of these services just yet, but um, the main focus is here for, for the simplicity of this. We'll go with um, with websites. Now, one of the things that you can see here, if um, oh, give me one second. I'm in Mac, so um, Control Plus is not going to do anything for me. Um, so at this point, <laughs> it's it's hard switching from Windows to Mac because you're like, oh, here's the shortcuts, and it's like, oh, wait a minute, I have to replace everything with a with an open command rather than a Windows key. But one of the things that I have listed here, I have different websites. I have a website that I have a demo called Orwell, you know, from 1980, the, the classic Apple commercial, 1984. Everybody's watching the TV it and everything else. Yeah. So and the reason why I chose the name was because. Uh, the whole purpose of this application, of this demo, as you can see, I have an Orwell, Orwell Player, Orwell Manager, Orwell CDN, Orwell Hub, and Orwell API, is that I try to take uh, all the different stacks, all the different uh, frameworks that ASP.NET offers and build an application, a system around it. And the whole, whole purpose of the system is literally to give you this. And uh, it's not, it's not going to be fancy. Uh, so here's the Gardens of the Galaxy trailer. I see that you know JJ that you have a, a, you're a Marvel fan, so so that so that's good. And you see that it's just playing the trailer. The most interesting thing about this though is I'm actually I'm going to I I'm going to switch here and I okay I'm going to stop sharing my uh, my screen here. And you see me right now. You can see my my pretty face. I can now go in here and select um, The Winter Soldier, another good Marvel movie. So what I'm going to do here is I have my iPad, and I'm kind of zooming in, trying to make the best out of it. And you see where it says player, video player, and it says play movie or play video? If I hit on it, and I won't do it just yet because I wanted to switch to the screen share. Right? So there's the gardens of the um, – I paused the, the, the movie. I'm going to hit play now. Maybe. Oh, there it is. Winter Soldier. So what I've demoed right now is that here's a real-time event application by me hitting play on this iPad on this totally separate application. I'm now controlling what you're viewing, what you should see, what you should think about. Again, Orwell uh, from 1984. 
So the, the, the whole concept here is that this application and, and the way you go about building this is pretty straightforward. And it's, you can take the skill sets that you had before and easily leverage them going forward. So if I, if I look at the application, if I look at the main player, right, and I'm going to actually go here with this one, it's just pretty straightforward. If I go to, uh, if I go to, kind of take a look at it, um, it it's just configured as a .NET 4.5 application. You know, default configuration within uh, what's what's out there, and um, it's just pretty you know pretty standard settings left and right for um, the way things are. So uh, the the way the code actually function is that if I were to come to the dashboard. Give me one second, and look at the FT, FTP. Uh, where did I click on that? Yes, and I forgot the username and password. That's the downside of all this: is that you keep forgetting what the username and password is. Uh huh. Need a password vault. I do have one. I just don't have it on this <laughs> because I'm running. Uh, uh, um, incognito, it doesn't enable it. <laughs> it's an add-in. So anyway, I go to sites. Uh, I go to site. I go to root. And this is just because again, we're just browsing it. And literally, it's nothing more than just a simple CSHTML file that has a bunch of just script files behind it. And um, the bin folder is really not much to it. Um, just standard libraries that we, you know you will install via NuGet. So this is literally a simple website that's running out in the cloud. But the interesting thing about this, if I go back to the listing of all these sites, is that this guy's the this player is actually running in the West US data center. That's in Silicon Valley. That's where the movie the, the movie clip sits stands. However, the thing that I punched on the iPad is running in the Washington DC data center. Everything else that I have in here, in the um, this is Oral Manager, CDN, everything, it's running in North Central, which is in Chicago. So what I've done is I literally connected this application from coast to coast through Chicago. So what happens is that this application, that's in, that where the video player sits, it sits out there. I issue a command going to a website in Washington, D.C., and seconds later it actually updates the video player. For our website running in uh, again in Silicon Valley, so pretty again, it's it's not anything out of the ordinary. And I'll see if I can bring up uh, Visual Studio in here. Very very nice and slick though to kind of show how how you can scale this. Yeah, and, and actually the best part about this, if you give me one second, I should have the code base here. Uh, Azure, yep, I do have it for Azure for ASP.NET. If you give me one second, yeah. The, the thing about it, too, is that the way I approach this application, I approach it by developing the code. I need to do that regardless, right? It's just how you go about picking and choosing what you're going to do with, with the code that's different. So um, small thing here, if everybody wants to see the code base, it's actually out on, on GitHub. So this there's no secret to this. It's not like I'm keeping this for to make money or anything else. Uh, it's actually, uh, if I scroll down, uh, hold on. Um, Sure. Where are? Where did you go? This is private. Oh, it's, there are too many. That's a good problem to have in GitHub, right? Too many. Uh, where was it? Uh, You're contributing oh, too much. I'm, I'm contributing too much. Exactly. Oh. Ah, it's not here. ASP. I probably haven't published it yet, so yeah, I, I'm wrong about that. <laughs> it's, it's not out there yet. I'll push it out here after the show. Anyway, it will be out here. Um, it's actually a repo that I had called Azure for ASP.NET um, that all the code base exists. Um, anyway, one of the things that if you see the, the project here, here's all the different web applications that I have listed. So I have the client, I have the API, I have the CDN, the data manager. Um, that just sit behind the scenes and just are ancillary, rather right? just kind of helper applications. Yeah, we lost so, uh, we lost your screen share, Javier. We're still oh, on the, uh, oh. Azure piece. Uh, the, uh, thing. All right, let me do that here. Start screen share, and there you go. 
Okay, you see visual. Okay, great. So that's the down to the flipping back and forth. Um, but if, if I go here, give me one second, and I'll just bring up Chrome inside of Visual Studio. And if I go to Azure dash, uh, sorry, Orwell dash data manager, actually, I think that's what the URL is. Uh, it's Orwell Manager. Orwell Manager. Manager that Azure websites.net. Uh, people will love this because it's actually this is a, a web forms application that I created by literally dragging and dropping. So that was the amount of code that I had for this is minimal. And what this allows me to do is allows me to say, hey, I need a new video. Give me the title. I go to YouTube, pull the key out from the URL. So if I go over here, uh, let's go look at YouTube.com. Let's look at Godzilla. Godzilla is a good movie, right? I'm, I'm waiting for it to see it. So uh, Godzilla. We'll find it up. There's the official trailer. And I'm just going to take this, and I'm going to copy that. So you see it's out of plane, all that fun stuff. I'll pause it. I will go Godzilla, not, not Godzilla. Um, hit add, and now it's listed down here. Okay, pretty straightforward. Not much to it. So if I actually come over to this Orwell, and there's the Winter Soldier, I'm gonna go. I'm I'm doing. I'm looking at my iPad right now, and I'm refreshing that video player I showed earlier. Um, so I can then go to Gojira, uh, and actually let me hit refresh in here. Uh, just make sure it's there. Um, I can hit play video. You can see that Godzilla is no, nope. It's still showing the old screen. Come on. Mad props for uh, giving us authenticity. There's the Godzilla there. Live demo. I mean, as live demo as with Google Hangouts can, can turn on. Oh, that's awesome. But it, again, the, the the code base for that. If you look at the data manager, right? If I, you know, now we, we see it running live, and and I won't debug in Visual Studio because I don't want to deal with the lag back and forth. I just kind of switch between the two. Uh, the data uh, for this, for the data manager, uh, that new video where I click add, this is what it looks like. Uh, and I can, it's still not refreshing, isn't it? The video. Um, screen sharing. Am I going too fast? You must be going too fast. Ninja like. All right, so there we go. There we go. Literally, the code base is just pull the title, pull the key, set it by using the a SQL data source, right? The same way we've been building uh, ASP.NET and others, we've been building applications for years. Bring it in here, the connection manager. Uh, I'm actually using um, SignalR to signal to people is like, hey, by the way, this happened behind the scenes. So if you really want to connect to that event, you can do so. There's an API behind the scenes that you don't even know. You don't even care that it's there. And it's actually executing. Um, wait for the connection to happen. You know, send people. It's like, hey, this we now have Godzilla. And and then uh, just stop it and just redirect back to the main page. So when I hit you know save or insert, it goes back to the main page, and that's all it does behind the scenes. And the um, the way this, I mean, if you look at the um, the web config and other pieces of this, they're just pretty strained applications. You know, here's how you run it locally. Here are the endpoints on how you run this on on Orwell. We have an API. We have the hub. So the API is web API that I'm using behind the scenes to kind of connect the two things. And I have the hub that actually handles SignalR. If you see here, I do have a data hub that I'm connecting to and I'm sending stuff to. So if I go look at that, what that data hub looks like in this project, there's really not much to it. What this does, the data hub just says, which is I'm calling this method, signal update. Uh, it just takes the name of the content, it takes the name of the title. It says, hey, here's, here's who did it. 
And by the way, just log that this happened, that there's this new movie called Godzilla placed out there. That's all it does, and it just continues on with the next task. So it's sort of, again, sort of behind the scenes messaging or processing that happens uh, for anybody for anybody to, to use. Um, the API, I kind of mentioned before, I'm using Web API for this. If I look at to look at this, the Web API code is very complex. Uh, by pulling data out of a database and shoving it down the pipe. So pull it out, select the titles that are there, create uh, the, the model, dump it into a list, and return it. It's literally as simple as that. Um, as I mentioned before, I'll switch here to uh, maybe. Yeah, it's having issues with, uh, with the multiple screens. Fine. Um, all of these are separate ASP.NET applications, running on Azure, running things differently. As I showed the um, the hub, since it's SignalR and it's doing, it can use WebSockets behind the scenes. If you go to the Configure tab, I have, uh, and I wait for the, the beautiful blue aura to finish up, you notice that I haven't turned on. So at this point, I'm not doing HTTP polling or anything behind the scenes. It's actually using the native sockets for communicating, enabled at the actually uh, IIS level. So it's I mean it's, it's a pretty neat little demo that I that I try to cover in about an hour when I do my presentation. Um, but it just shows you that literally at this point, I'm just writing ASP.NET applications, deploying out in Azure, turning a couple things here and on. And granted, knowing what each of these buttons takes a while to get to. To understand, um, but it's just you know just playing around with playing around with it and getting to understand you know what what you get out of it. So yeah, and this um, is like a quick a kind of this is like kind of a quick like look at what uh, what different ways you can communicate as far as across you know the web API and and then handling the back end and then you know distributing the new information and tracking it. So yeah, it's very very awesome stuff. And, yeah. And, and, Go ahead, sir. Oh, I was going to say, and uh, to think of all the code we had to write to do web sockets and the signal R type stuff before, right? And oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just there for us. Yeah, and then I see at this point, you know, it's you know we have I think we have Azure, we have ASP.NET, and, and everything. The interesting thing is not that it's just to put it all together. It took me about two hours. All the different applications. I didn't have to worry about web servers. I didn't have to worry about X, Y. I just like here's my vision. I can ship it. And so as we were talking about, it's like how do we kids how do we get kids excited about what's going forward? This is this is the beginning of many awesome great things that are going to come down the pipe, right? So uh, I remember when I was you know when I was growing up and I was uh, a fat Mexican kid and living in rural Iowa and I was like you know what I would love to stream video from the internet because I have the internet now and I want to be able to watch a movie whenever it is and I, I knew how I knew how it could, it could be done. We just have a web server and we have movies out there. And we just go to the web page and it just plays. But at that point, it's like, oh, we have to use Real Player. Remember Real Player? Oh yeah. <laughs> we, we do all that stuff, and it's like, oh, it's not going to be great, but we could do it. And I'm thinking about this, and now everybody Netflix, everybody yep. Hulu's, everybody whatever other verb thing that we take to a <laughs> to a company name, everybody does it. And that was literally less than 15 years ago. Yeah, no, no, you're you're exactly right. And that, you know, one of the big powers of Azure, and I know you're not showing it here. Um, you know, your yours is more easy, easy configuration and and deployment, yeah. right? But uh, let's go to the next step where you want five hundred thousand people to watch your video clips, right? All you have to do is mark the mark it as scalable. Go to a standard version, just scale it to as many pieces as you need under auto scale, as I see right on the screen there, yep. and that's that's cool. Yeah, I mean, as I should have mentioned there, guys, is that I went through that Orwell, that that the player where the YouTube yep. literally player sits. If I wanted to, you know, make it web scale, I first of all I have to turn it up to standard. So uh, at that point is when you go to standard, it's you're telling Azure, hey, by the way, I'm going to need a virtual machine. Give me yep. a dedicated virtual machine. And then down here where it says capacity, well, how big do you want that virtual machine? One core, two core, four cores? Oh my. You can say, "Hey, I'll go with one small core." And by the way, uh, I would like to have ten of them. So that allows you to have ten small, 
10 small one core applications that are just sitting there handling the request of the application behind the scenes. And as you can see here, there's scale by metric. If you're doing something CPU heavy and you're doing whatever that is, you can say, hey, by the way, I want you to scale between one to three instances or one and six instances, whatever that is. Whenever I hit the CPU threshold of between 30 and, say, 60%. So the moment your CPU and your virtual machine is sitting there saying, getting all this load, it's just going to go, go straight up. Or if you know that at a certain time, you know, it says schedule times, you know you're busy between 9 and 5 because you're running a business or you're doing whatever, then you can say, hey, set up a schedule between this hour and this hour, give me this many, this many instances. So during, during business hours, give me all the horsepower I need. After business hours, just give me one or two instances because no one's going to be there. Yeah, I, I can see that totally for, you know, um, business hours or during batch processing times, right? If you're going to ship batch mm -hmm. processing up to something like this, scale it up for two, three hours at night when you know your batch processes are running and then scale it right back down. You're paying pennies compared to buying a machine. Correct, yeah, and and, see, and, and that's the thing is that to do, you could do this now with hardware. You have to buy servers or with the virtual machines, you have to load balancers, you got a bunch of other stuff, uh, and it works great. Uh, but the thing about it here too, um, Gus, is that, uh, we're just talking about one data center, right? We're talking about here's the data center in, um, I think this, I said west. And we'll go yeah, through. That one's west. Yeah, this one was west. So this is in the west data center. It's in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Say if I actually come down here and I click on this little guy, this little icon called Traffic Manager. Traffic Manager is a feature. It, it's, it's a service that allows you to literally put endpoints or your application all over the world and it's smart enough to actually load balance based of where you're at. So if I'm in Japan watching the Godzilla trailer, which is, you know, I had to kind of pose it that way, I go to the Japan data center. <laughs> I go to the Japan data center if my application is running there. I don't have to go all the way to Silicon Valley to get it. So if I, and, and how simple it is is I can say, hey, I'm going to do this as Orwell, right? trafficmanager.net, I care about, there's three, three scenarios, performance, round robin, and failover. Performance is what I just described. It takes you to the closest region, the closest data center you're, that you're geographically near to you. Round robin is, it's going to shoot you all wherever you tell it to. Right? It's going to do one, two, three, four, next, one, two, three, four, next. Failover is literally, it's meant what it is. It's like, go here. If this is, it's not there, then flip it over to to this other situation, uh, this other spot, I'll go to performance. It will sit there and spin and create um, the orbital profile. And at this point, where it says endpoints, I can hit and, and I can say website. Oh, by the way, and this tells you the endpoints that are available. So see where it says North Central and you know U.S. and so forth. I could have the same Orwell dash JP for Japan or Orwell dash you know, EU for Europe, whatever else, and I can just check it and hit OK. And depending where I'm at, this thing just automatic, automatically will work. So it's it's kind of, again, it's kind of neat the way that um, they have it. Yeah, that that's real time solution to you know her you know to, to get things done lickety split instead of like wondering where those uh, centers at and then worrying about the connections and then you can kind of uh, tailor your your back end data to capture and see well who's looking at it you know where's the most traffic coming from so that we can make sure that we're putting our resources there and and mm -hmm. for business standpoint this this totally takes care of a lot of a lot of the back end stuff like really really quick. Yeah, I mean like I'd love to know how they do Google Hangouts. Like, be, like, I would like to see the man behind the curtain for this. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Brian, is how I, I, they... likened, uh, I likened Skype the other day to Butters. If you're a South Park fan, you, you might like that. But, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I would like to also see that as well, to kind of what uh, what that looks like. Yeah. yeah, me too. Totally. Totally. But, yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, even and in, in the thing about it, too, if you don't know where to begin, you know, uh, you can start very simple by just going to the, you know, going to your websites Create new, uh, quick create. We can call it, you know, um, code cast uh, de demo, and put it in the put it in Chicago. And literally behind the scenes, just sitting there and creating that website for us. So he's done. 
um, give it a second here. It's going to give us the URL uh, down here. Come on. Where did you go? Come to me. Fighting on you, Javier. <laughs> I know. It's scared. Uh, actually, it's probably I'm just being lazy, and I can just do this. Uh, uh, AngelWebsites.net. The question is, am I faster than Azure before it provisions the web uh, the website? We will see. And there you go. There's a website that just we just created on the fly. Nice. And as as we were uh, demoing before, I was showing you the FTP piece. Uh, I can actually go in here and set up the you know set up the deployment, and I can FTP into it, or I can push to it. It doesn't matter. This is a website, not web website that is running on the same virtual machine as all these other ones are. Uh, give it a second. Standard, you know. See, you see it down here. All of these are sharing that virtual machine, running oh. out, running out in Chicago. That's really and, slick. Yeah, and this, and you know, and 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 looking at what you just did there, that's a better solution than, I mean, again, I we, I, I often talk about scalability. Like even with your knowledge as well as like your approach to things, you don't want to. You don't want to try to build a house on a dime, you know what I mean? And 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 just try to throw up some, you know, HTTP, you know, just a FTP server, whatever the case may be. You don't want to do anything. This is the way to go to understand that you can scale this thing. You can have multiple machines running. You can have, you can create a website. Yeah, that's fun and cool to show kids and stuff with maybe, you know, the the Chrome experience or just like kind of a one-off scenario and just kind of show them what they can do. But this really kind of gets into some more nuts and bolts and and really kind of allows. Uh, for scalability on a massive scale to show yeah. that so many things can be built and done with this interface and, and, and doing it this way as opposed to just kind of, oh, okay, yeah, that was cool for like five minutes, but uh, let's, you know, just pay somebody else to do this. No, you, let's sit down and yeah. figure this thing out. You know what I mean? Yeah, and honestly, that's the reason why I chose the, the video player demo, right, because everybody understands YouTube. Everybody does you know, Hulu or Netflix or anything else, and it's just, like, hey, you know, here's a problem, right? Here's how you can solve it. It's not the way to solve it. Uh, but the cool thing about it is that it helps you reach that aha moment sooner because now you you, you think you can relate to it. And and hopefully if you, that relation happens, then you can dig into each individual silo that's out there for each application. So, yeah, but, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, uh, actually the other demo that I have in here, uh, if you guys can see here, and, and I'll talk, touch it briefly, like I said, I run a .NET user group. Um, well, I'm not just myself; a bunch of other guys here in the morning do. And I started the code camp and speaking, you know, conferences. There's always giveaways at the end of the thing. You know, where we have the big grab bag. And how do we typically do it? I right, have everybody number off. <laughs> go to random.org, check. You know, everybody <laughs> does it. <laughs> you laugh because that's 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 the process. So what we do here is that. This is a, uh, an application that is actually part of my SignalR um, talk, where I want to talk about how this is built with SignalR, similar to uh, the Orwell, where you actually register on, register for the event. So it says, welcome, Javier, blah, 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 your email. And I actually have a, a URL called pick, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to do it here. I'm going to do a new tab. I'm going to paste that there. And the password is cleverly one two three four five. <laughs> and really, what it does is says pick winner, and it says we have a winner. So just pick something out of the box. But it tells you you're a winner. So what this allows us to do is that you can actually sit as an attendee of any user group. Just go to your phone, log in here, type in your username. And I, I thought about adding, you know, uh, GitHub and Facebook and whatever else login. Type it in. You authenticate. I don't care about it. I just care about your name and your email so I can send you your license or whatever you win. And I'm just going to over here pick winners. Just hit next one, next one, next one, and you're going to get a little thing on your application that's going to say, hey, you're a winner. You're a winner. You're a winner. Or you, if you don't win, it actually says loser. So I figured <laughs> that would be fine. Uh, but it actually says, you know, loser, loser. Uh, and it, But it, it lets you know who actually won, and it's a heck of a lot easier. Oh, yeah. Remembering a number or anything else, but again, it's just powered by you know powered by Azure ASP.NET, and it's something again solving a simple problem that everybody understands because we've all done it a different way. So. 
Awesome. Well, that was that was really cool and and kind of unique and insightful way to uh, to check out at the the, you know, the Azure uh, stack and and how the back end uh, web and all of that's done. Um, that was that was really cool. I, I hope people can uh, pick up on that. And we'll also have once you have that on GitHub, we'll put that in our show notes yeah. and a link on our uh, on our site. So when people go and watch this video, they can just scroll down and and click on some of that and uh, and, and kind of you know play around with it and see what see what they can do with it. Um, the, uh, the the next thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about, and maybe we'll just make this kind of quick and short, was uh, distributable across you know like a. Um, because you're using the web to do it, because you're using this in a browser, mm -hmm. you can kind of scale it to mobile devices as well as you know your traditional PCs and your, your like a tablet or whatever the case may be. Is so that again, that's when I talk about scalability. That that's a, a really nice uh, selling point for this particular, um, you know, ASP, uh, Azure, all that stuff. Yep. No, you're right. At this point, is is you're solving a problem. Yes, you're you're targeting your audience, and it doesn't mean it could be Node, it could be Rails, it could be it could be whatever you want. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's how do you target, and, and what are you trying to accomplish? Totally, totally. You're up, Gus. All right. Well, Javier, since we've gotten through uh, through the demos, is there anything else you wanted to show real quick before we had a no, couple more questions for you? Not at all. This is just kind of wanted to kind of browse for some of it and to talk about it. I didn't get to Notepad. I'm sad. Oh, that's uh, okay. <laughs> But, but since we were having lag and back and forth issues with the desktop, I didn't want to just pause and redo that again. So yeah. we'll do that some other time. Okay, that makes sense. Go ahead and pop back to your uh, camera if you can. Yeah. We'll do, sir. So, so I have a, a huge question for you. I mean, this is huge for us uh, developers yeah. and, and technology people, but what do you do away from the keyboard? Uh, I, I spend time with my family. As you can see, my, my son is back there. So say, say hi, Dominic. Hi. <laughs> I was just trying to be in the background, yo, and you pulled me in. <laughs> well, but what are your hobbies and passions outside of development? Uh, Do you have any? Um, yeah, my family. I, mean, I said I, I love spending time with my kids. I have three little boys. Uh, you know, Dominic was my eldest at eight. I have an eight-year-old, five-year-old, and a three-year-old, so I'm busy with that. Oh, uh, yeah, that's uh, a hobby. So, right? Yeah, right now, right now it's baseball season. So we're busy with Little League games and all that fun stuff. Um, so I, I love spending time with my boys and my wife and, and everything. And, but when I'm not with them, you know, obviously geeking out and these sort of things, okay. I'm into, I, I, love, I love to play golf whenever I can get out to it and, and just, you know, just read and, and kind of learn a little more about what's out there. So. Cool. Well, next time I'm down your way, we'll have to go out and play golf. Yeah, that sounds great. As long as there isn't six feet of snow on the ground, that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the weather's been crazy schizophrenic this year. It's just been really, really strange throughout the Midwest for sure. Um, so, uh, what? Uh, where can our audience find out more about you? And where can they find out if 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 they want to contact you and say, "Hey, you know, saw your demo. I uh, got a quick question about this, or whatever the case may be." Is where can people find you, and and where are you most visible? Yeah, actually, the best way to find me is on Twitter. Like, uh, my my Twitter handle is at, at jg. Lozano, L-O-Z-A-N-L. -L. Uh, people post questions all the time. Um, like I mentioned before, I'm in the process of rebooting my blog, and my blog is kind of be more of like, hey, you know, here's you can do X, you can do Y. I, I have great posts in the past, but I just got busy with everything else. Right. That I that I kind of just called bankruptcy on that one, and I <laughs> right. focused on Twitter. Oh, just because yeah, it's easier, right? It's a, it's a, it's a different conversation. Um, so that's that's. Probably the, the main way to uh, contact me. Also, um, if people want to hit me on you know, Google Plus, Facebook, and things, you know, I, there's multiple multiple avenues. All roads lead to Rome. That's all I can tell people. So there you go. Yeah, hot. And um, uh, let's see. So what do you see as the next technological niche? I'm sure uh, Gus would love to hear your your thoughts on this one. Hey, he's so, got me stoked here. Uh, so the one that I think is the next technological niche, which I kind of have a bit of a passion into it, so uh, it's actually uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, the reason why it is, you know, you guys remember Sunday Night Live, uh, the old you know, back when it was good, yeah, oh, <laughs> like yeah. In the early '90s. Linda Richmond, you know, yep. she was like, you know, like a, she always have something, and, and we, you know, myself and uh, John Von Giller, another MVP here out of Des Moines. 
we joke around, and it's like, the Internet of Things, neither an Internet or Things, discuss. <laughs> uh, and, oh <laughs> and, the, and the reason why I find it so interesting is not because of these little tiny devices. I mean, the devices are fun. Don't get me wrong. I, I have, I have uh, two Raspberry Pis. I also bought a Spark I.O. Um, device. Um, board. You know what that is? So the Spark I.O. board, if you could go check it out, uh, spark.io, it's a little a breadboard that actually runs Arduino code. And what it is, it's all your code that you write is in JavaScript. And this little chip actually connects to their platform. And you just send the commands. So if you want to read from a temperature sensor, you can do that via this, this little board. And you can post it back via JavaScript. So it's not like you have to be this excellent embedded coder or anything else. You just literally put the chip in there. You have enough power in the thing. And there's an internet connection to it, whether it be a gas, you know, Wi-Fi, or anything else. And it will connect to it. And it will send that data back and forth. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's it's so minuscule and it's I, mean, I bought the kit for about a hundred bucks and it comes with a breadboard and a bunch of sensors and a bunch of wires and everything that you can put together. Uh, so it's pretty neat from that perspective. But you know, looking at that, um, honestly, um, I'm wearing right now a um, a Fitbit. Nice. So kind of kind of what the Fitbit has, you know, mobile devices. It's just that connectivity, right? And like I said, you know, about 15 years ago and so forth, when I was sitting there as a little kid wishing that I could watch movies over the internet. Right now we're, now we're here, and now we're and now we're playing around with little devices. That's right. where I think um, it's not gonna. I'm gonna say it's not gonna create a niche, but it's gonna be the next big ripple, because now you're gonna really internet all the things. Yep. Equates to connect all the things, which is gonna you know make us wonder about how do we view security, how do we view yep. data, how do we view the interaction, and it's gonna from my perspective it's gonna be a big next revolution that goes. Yeah, and we, we've already seen the security ripple come through, so yes. um, we've got that. But, you know, when we talk about connecting everything, I think back to um, people that have, like, the Pepsi, Coke, you know, vending machine routes. Mm -hmm. where They have to go out, you know, X amount of times a week or a, a, a month or whatever to refill their machines. Well, if that machine is connected, they know exactly what's in that machine today right. looking at a tablet so they know hey I have to drive to this address to refill these chips right. but I don't have to go to these other three because nobody's bought anything yep. and actually so, even, even taking that to a step further right if you build that with analytics or smartness <laughs> right yep. as you can say hey by the way you have these you know these ones you have to fill out and here's the best route yep exactly go to this one first go to this one go to this one go to this one Yep, exactly. So, I mean, uh, not uh, so uh, what we're looking at in the long run, right, is a little bit of economic savings for the consumer because the pe uh, the people refilling them are spending less time there mm -hmm. in a in a better way, right, or better route, gas savings, etc., more time savings. Therefore, hopefully the consumer or the company makes a little bit more money on the uh, at the end or both actually would be the best. So, you know, it's it's cool. It's uh, we've got some really cool stuff coming up. So, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I have a question for you guys. Um, so uh, this was actually uh, asked, uh, somebody hit me up. Um, the security elements of this, um, when you, and, you, and you brought it up, how, how do you guys see, do you guys think that there's going to be more industry than um, private solutions? Do you think there's going to be um, like, like dedicated like go to like do you think there's going to be like a class of engineers that all they do is just you know security and uh, data encryption and uh, unencrypting things and being able to communicate or do you think it's still going to be kind of a free free for all like it is right now and that the reason why I say it like that is because uh, the, we are moving forward with the connected uh, the the web of things and, and different uh, the internet of things rather and um, how we approach that and how we handle that back-end data with, with, with keeping privacy because that is kind of a big concern for um, I know uh, small business and big business is that how do we protect not only ourselves but our cons customers and our, our people uh, that trust us with that information so where do you guys how do you, where do you guys fall on, on that like what, what would be a solution well, I, you know, I, I think we actually already have that. Uh, we already have people that are that are specialized. The problem is is the one statement you said, the Internet net of things. That's a completely new technology and a completely new platform. So we're going to have to spawn some of our current people, as Javier mentioned earlier in the show. They're going to have to learn something new and morph into this new person, right, with the new new um, 
knowledge and the new technology. And I'll let Javier finish up on that. No, you're right. And honestly, it's you know I've, I always like to use the analogy of um, doctors and medicine, right? So if you look at the beginning with doctors were first came out, they were generalists, you know, they were judge, jury, and executioners, right? There were the dreads of, of, of medicine out there. And as the as the field and and the art, right, this field, uh, what's art and science at the same time, um, started to evolve. Everybody, you know, we had cardiologists, we had pulmon, you know, um, oncologists, you know, uh, gastroenterologists and so forth that we went through, but we still have general doctors. Right, that kind of that, that you go through it and you go through and it's like, you know what, we think it's this. Let me say, let me forward you on. So I think you know that pattern has happened across all bunch of different other um, industries and other different um, uh, disciplines. So yeah, that's a, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean that 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 is that is a good way to explain to somebody for sure. Yeah, and I'm, and and I think sorry, and I think and I think we're just in the cusp. You know, we're very new into this. Like we're talking about punch cards and everything else, <laughs> and uh, earlier in the show, and I think that's where we're we're eventually be evolved. And again, it is the knowledge not of what you learn in computer science. I mean, I went to computer science and I learned zero about programming. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I learned I learned a ton about proof. Proofs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Theorems and yeah. proofs. Yeah, I could spout those off all day. Could I do something? Probably not. No. Yeah, I'm exactly. Well, well, and and I and do that in my spare time. Yeah, and to step on top of uh, Javier's piece, I completely agree with you because I think the uh, you know when when you were talking you know v, uh, VB one through six and then dot net and whatnot, the a person could uh, could know a lot and almost all of VB six five four three you know for the most mm -hmm. part, but when you got to dot net. All of a sudden, you had to specialize a little bit more. And as the versions of .NET have come out, trying to know everything is almost impossible. So now we've got specialists, just as you said. And we're going to have to see the same thing with security across platform as well. Yeah. Yeah, and with without a, obstruction of, um, of speed, because that sometimes holds up, you know, um, we were just talking about the browser, you know, the in private browsing or or the uh, you know the the blocking of all sorts of different. So we got to think about speed and about connectivity and how all that functions. Guys, it's been a phenomenal conversation. Th Javier, thank you so much for being on the show. You're thank um, you very much. We do want to throw out some announcements, so uh, we're going to say our announcements. If you have any announcements, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Gus, go ahead and tell uh, tell our listeners what you have going on and uh, coming up soon. Sure. Well, uh, May 15th, 16th, and 17th, I'll be in case, uh, Kansas City doing KCDC. Um, and next week, our show will be Keith Dalby. Um, Keith is a uh, person out of Iowa as well, um, except he's out of Cedar Rapids, just a little bit uh, east of you. But he's an Iowa yeah. Stater, too. Yes, he is an Iowa Stater as well, and a phenomenal um, all-around coder. I mean, the guy is just a genius. So uh, it, it'll be an interesting talk next week as well. And uh, as I said, Javier, I'd let you sneak in right before him because you know him. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, But that's what I've got going on right now. Um, JJ, what do you have going on? Well, um, the STL Windows Phone Group uh, has a meetup on May the 12th, so if you're in the area, um, please come by and see us. It's going to be from 11 to 1, our usual time on Saturday. Uh, join our Facebook group. It's a STL Windows Phone Group. If you're not even interested in the Windows Phone, if you just want to uh, join a cool group, uh, come join us. It, it's awesome. We, we just hang out and we talk about uh, everything uh, Windows Phone and technological related, and uh, yeah, there you know, we're, we're, there's not a whole bunch of us, but uh, the ones that are there are the quality of people that you want to surround yourselves <laughs> with. So please, uh, please join the group, and uh, it'd be fun uh, to talk about that conversation. But the really big announcement that uh, I want to talk about is Microsoft is uh, supporting the National Small Business Week, the the week of KCDC. So while Gus and Kevin, our editor in chief of the site. Uh, are going to be out in Kansas City. Me and our new uh, member of the team, Alejandro Ramirez, are going to be in the Microsoft store pretty much covering the small business aspect of what Microsoft can do uh, for small business. There's going to be giveaways. There's going to be prizes. There's going to be all sorts of different things that we're going to be covering on our site. I'm going to be there. We're going to be talking with local business, bringing in uh, people, uh, kids, uh, adults, gamers, whoever, uh, to talk about what uh, BizSpark and all the different uh, DreamSpark programs and everything to get people involved. We're also going to do an STL Tech Talk podcast from the store. 
So uh, it's going to be really cool. To see, uh, people can walk in live and and hang out, and you know we can we're going to talk to the different associates, and we're going to talk about the different products that Microsoft off, uh, offers to um, business. It's going to be just a lot of fun. So we're really looking forward to uh, to what's coming up next. It's awesome. That is awesome, JJ. That's great news. Yeah, so we're uh, we're gonna be seen. We're gonna be seen. There's gonna be a lot of people, and it's funny because where the Microsoft store is, we're just gonna be kind of looking across the way at our iOS brother and going, "Hey, we're here." <laughs> so uh, if you want us to come over there, you need to throw an event. Um, no, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. So uh, that's where we're gonna be. A uh, special thank goes uh, thanks go out to uh, everybody who has participated uh, so far in Codecast. We're growing exponentially. Um, Javier, uh, it, it's great to have you on. Do you have any announcements that's uh, coming up? Uh, any um, events? No, actually, the only uh, I'll be in Kansas City, KCDC, speaking uh, alongside with Gus uh, on the 16th, I think. So, and beyond that, and since summer's starting up, I, I'm taking. I usually take summer off so I can be crazy with my family, and then sure. kind of pick up, pick it up at the end of the fall again. So I hope to get into, I have a couple talks, I mean, um, a couple sessions that I want to submit to several conferences, so I hope they pick me. Uh, and then, uh, but yeah, that's sort of what, what I have in plan for the next couple months. Great. Yeah, and we'll awesome. see in KC. Yeah, yeah, you guys are going to have a lot of fun without me, but uh, it's okay. It's okay. I'll be there next year. Promise. All right. Uh, with with that being said, Gus, is there anything you want to add to the end of this fantastic episode? Uh, just thank you, Javier. You've done a great job. We'll get you back to your family here in a minute <laughs> and let you get going with your night. And uh, tell, him, tell him just to keep his eye on the ball. Just keep his eye on the ball. That's what my dad always used to say, and he used to throw it in my head. Um, no, uh, but thank you again so much for being on. And from the entire STL Tech Talk crew, um, good coding. Have a great night.